Now, the new Commonwealth Integrity Commission has been unveiled this week, as you know, albeit in draft form. It's a comprehensive approach to detecting corruption, but is it powerful enough? Let's ask someone who's worked in this space, the chair of the Centre for Public Integrity and former Assistant Commissioner to the New South Wales ICAC, Anthony Wheely QC. Anthony, thank you very much for your time. Chris, thank you for having me. Now, most people would think that a body like this has to be well-equipped enough to gather information, investigate, and then pass that over to, you know, the public prosecutor for the possibility of a trial or a case involved in criminal activity. You say that that's not necessarily what a federal ICAC should be about. What should it be about? Well, whether it's a federal ICAC or a state or territory ICAC, uh, describing it in that way, Chris, is entirely inaccurate and, in, and shows a great misunderstanding on the part of people who think that way. The, the, the role of an anti-corruption body is to uncover uh, serious corruption and to expose it publicly. That's what its job is. And it's given the power to do that by the conferral of coercive powers and other powers which the police don't have and which the direct republic prosecutions doesn't have and it has to use those powers to dig into the dark corners where corruption always exists and expose publicly the one thing it is not it's not a gatherer of evidence for prosecutions and can i just explain why that's so sure. Chris, if i may the coercive powers to which I've made reference enable the anti-corruption bodies to force people to answer questions that may incriminate them. Mm -hmm. And as again, I, I make the point, that's not something the police can do. You're entitled, in general, when you're being investigated by the police, uh, to refuse to answer if there's the prospect of incrimination. But these strong powers that the anti-corruption body has forces people to give the answer and thus to expose the truth. Now, that's an extraordinary power, but there's a trade-off for it. And the trade-off is that whatever the answer is, whatever admission is made, if I admit that I've been guilty of corrupt conduct, that cannot be used against me yep. in any criminal proceedings. OK, so, Anthony Wheelie, if the model doesn't convert to a public hearing model, and it's not at this stage, you think it's a waste of time? Oh, no. I, look, I, I wouldn't go that far. They've put a lot of work into this bill, Chris, an enormous amount of work. And, uh, you know, I congratulate them on some of the detail. But the five or six essential points they've missed out on, and they are these. One, the, the definition of corrupt conduct is not wide enough. It needs to capture outsiders, people who aren't public servants, who try and corrupt public servants. It yep. doesn't do that. Right. All the state bodies do. Uh, secondly, the threshold for starting an investigation uh, is reasonable suspicion of a criminal offence. Serious corruption often is a criminal offence, but sometimes it can be offence that is not criminalised. So no. you need to have a wider definition. OK. And Some interesting Chris, talking points that I know we've got until February before submissions end. So there's yes, plenty, plenty of time, really. Plenty, yeah, yeah, exactly. Anthony Wheelie, QC, thank you very much for your time this evening. Good. Uh, thank you very much, Chris.